a really exciting morning for us as a church for a couple reasons. First, uh, today we're starting uh, a second service that launches, not this service, it's the next service, 1045. We're starting a brand new second service today, which... Uh, Boy, I tell you what, just to see how God has led us and brought us to this point, it's, it's a pretty exciting season for us, uh, which, by the way, um, if you were worried about me preaching too long, you came to the right service. Um, so good choice, good choice. Uh, but it's also exciting because today we're starting a, a new series called uh, After God's Own Heart, and we are looking through the life of really the most famous Old Testament person in the Old Testament, King David. And we're starting by looking at his most famous story. And it's not just his. I think it's the most famous story in the whole of the Old Testament. It's the story of David and Goliath. And I say it's famous because, you know, you think about it, it's become a metaphor that, quite frankly, our culture uses pretty consistently to describe any time the big guy takes or the little guy takes on the big guy, right? We use it in politics. Uh, we use it in sporting events. Uh, we use it in business. We use it in the courtroom. It's David and Goliath's story. We know this story. You know this story. You spent any time around the church. If you grew up going to Sunday school, you probably heard this story at least once a year, and that's the danger of it. Right? The more that we know a story in the Bible, the more dangerous it becomes because we get to these places where we assume we, we already know the story, we don't really need to listen anymore. There, there's nothing that I can really get out of this story. I've heard it already. I've been in Sunday school, got this down. I don't need to listen or pay attention. But, but here, let me just give you two reasons why I think that that's actually a bad way to think about this. I think this is a story we need, and it's a story that you need to listen to, I need to listen to, and let me tell you why. Two reasons. Number one, because it's not just a story. This is a real, true, historical event. These are real, historical people. This actually took place. There really was a David. There really was a Goliath. But not only is it a real, historical, true account, but I want you to think about that. It was recorded and it was put in this book, which is more than just a book. All right, so the Bible and the way that we look at this book is we see this as God's word to us. It's not just, this is not man's word written down with ideas about who God is, with nice stories that make us go, oh, wouldn't that be nice if that's actually true? That this is actually written down. This is God's word written to us, which means every time we come to this, there's something that God wants to say to us. It doesn't matter how many times you're reading the story, how many times you're reading a passage, how many times you come to Psalm 23, the Lord is your shepherd, that every single time you come to this book, no matter where you are, it's living and active that God wants to say something to you through it, including this story. The story is the same, the truth is the same, the truth doesn't change, but you do. And today you come here and we look at this story at a time when you're no longer the person you were the last time you came to this story. You're in new situations, you're in new circumstances, and what that tells me is that most likely there are things in this story that you need today that you didn't need the last time you came to this story. There are truths that you need to hear today that maybe you weren't in a place where you were ready to hear them. Today God wants to say something to you through this story. God is always speaking to us through his word. It's just a question of whether or not we're listening. The second reason that I think you and I, we need to listen to this story today is because this last week there was a name added to a list. And it's a list that I hate. His name is Jared. He was a father. He was a husband. And he was a pastor. And on Monday, we found out that he took his own life. And it's a growing list, a list that has been growing in our time. And what that tells me, at least what it confirms, because I already know it from my own experience, and you know it from your own experience, even if you haven't labeled it this way, here's what it tells me is that giants are real. Not just physical giants like Goliath in this story, but we're talking about mental, emotional, especially spiritual giants that have invaded our lives that put us in these places where we feel stuck, we feel trapped, we feel overwhelmed, we feel powerless, we feel hopeless, as if it's, we're never going to be able to change. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You have giants in your life that are, they are stealing your time and your energy. They're killing your joy and your peace, and they're destroying your life. 
every single person in this room. And what the story of David and Goliath tells me is that the majority of us, that's exactly where we're living. We are living under the control of giants in our lives. Because there's only one person in the whole story that wasn't under the control of Goliath. Everybody else was living in a place of fear. The majority of us in this room are living in a place where you are controlled by your giant. That's the way that most people are living their lives. And yet the second thing that this story tells me is this. It doesn't have to be that way. You can see your giant defeated and you can see your giant destroyed. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. God wants you to have the fullness of life that one day you get to the end of it and you can look back and go, I actually lived. If you're going to do that, your giants have to fall. The question is, how does that happen? And that's what we're going to see this morning. And here's the big idea. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And by the way, for those of you who are new, there's notes in your bulletin with fill, fill in the blanks that you can fill in as you go. You don't have to do it. We're not going to check at the door or anything like that. It's there as a tool for you if you want to use it. But here's our big idea this morning. Giants are destroyed by God who is at work in and through us. Giants are destroyed not by you. Giants are destroyed by God who is at work in and through you. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. Would you stand with me? Uh, We're going to pray and then we're going to read our passage together. All right. And I know for some of you, you're new. Uh, This is what we do because we, again, we believe this is God's word and we stand in honor to it together. We're going to actually start in uh, just a few moments in verse 32. But let me pray for us first. God, thank you for being able to gather here together this morning to worship, to sing, to hear, to pray, to open your word and to learn. And Father God, I pray that, that as we read and as we look at this passage together, God, that as you speak to us, God, that we would have, we would, we, we would stop, slow down and really listen. You'd help us to hear. You'd help us to understand, and and God, that you'd give us a heart that responds with a yes to what it is that you're calling us to today. God, I believe you want to speak to every single person here in this room, myself included. And so, Father, I pray that we would not allow ourselves to get in the way, and that you'd help us not to get in the way, but we would really, we'd hear, and we'd be free. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to read this. We're going to start in verse 32, all right? This is when the words that David, or excuse me, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, which is Goliath. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, and he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David, and his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. 
The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. This is God's word. You can go ahead and be seated. So the big idea is that God destroys giants. Our giants are destroyed by God, who is at work in and through us. There are three things that I just want to show you this morning in this passage, that if you want to see your giant fall, if you want to see it destroyed and defeated, and you want to actually be free, three things that this passage is telling us. All right, number one, here it is. Number one, if you're going to be free, then you've got to actually know your enemy. And and what I mean by this is that you have to be able to name your giant, not give it a name, but identify it. To actually be able to say, here's the giant that's in my life. This is the giant that I'm facing. The obvious and simple question to ask, but not necessarily to answer when we come to this passage, is just, what's your giant? What's the giant or giants? Because some of us have more than one. I have a whole group of giants in my life. But everybody has at least one. What's your giant? For David, it's a really easy one to answer, right? I mean, he's got a physical flesh and blood giant that's on the battlefield that's taunting them, and everybody knows his name is Goliath. It's not hard for David to go, well, I'm not really sure what my giant is. He knows. But see, for us, we're not talking about dealing with physical flesh and blood giants. We're talking about, again, those mental, emotional, and spiritual giants. They're not quite so obvious. And some of us might be tempted to say, well, this, I don't really need this message. I don't really have any giants in my life. Which, in my mind, is the same as a fish saying, I'm not wet. We live in a world of giants. It's like saying, I live in this world, but I'm not affected by it. If you live in this world, you're affected by it. And one of the ways that you're affected by it is by these giants that are invading your life, not when you plan, not when you've got it scheduled. They come in at times when you aren't ready for them. And you may not be aware of what they are. You may not be able to name them right now, but you have them in your life. They're there, and the question is, well, what are they? How do you actually know? And I think the answer is in this passage. If you rewind with me back to verse 11 this morning, I want to show you how you can identify your giant. But let me kind of give you a little background up to this verse. So the Philistines are the arch nemesis, the arch enemy of Israel, right? They're that nation that just keeps, throughout the Old Testament, just keeps attacking and and bothering them as a nation. And they've invaded Israel, and they've lined up for for battle on one side of this valley, which, by the way, is not a desert area. So all those, like, Sunday school pictures that you imagine in your mind, this is like a lush green area. There's a valley, it's a, there's a wadi, which is like a a rain-filled stream down the middle that's probably dry, but it's still green and lush. They line up on one side of the valley. Israel comes up and lines up on the other side of the valley. They've drawn battle lines, army against army, but before the battle starts, there's one person that comes out of the Philistines, their champion which champion means it's their representative. This is the way, not the way the Jews would fight, but the way that the Philistines would fight is they would have this one champion who would go out as their representative. And this is what Goliath does. He goes out as their representative and he explains it to Israel. He says, here's what we're going to do. I am the representative for my army. You pick somebody to represent your army. We're going to fight. And whoever wins, the losers become the servants of the other army. So if I win, Israel, you're our servants. If you win, we're your servants. And then it says he begins to taunt them and to mock them. And verse 11, look at it. It says, when Saul and Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, the word dismayed, it's not really a great translation because it sounds like they're like, oh, darn, there's a giant on the field. Dismayed doesn't sound very strong, but what it literally means is this. They were shattered. The Hebrew word means to be shattered. It means on the inside, they felt like they were falling apart as they listened and saw this giant and listened to what he said. They were overwhelmed to the point of just falling apart. And not only are they shattered, it says they're greatly afraid, and that's more than just being scared. When you think about fear, fear in your life gets expressed in lots of different ways. Fear can be expressed in stress. When you're stressed, it's because there's something that you're afraid of in your life. Worry anxiety, and by the way, sometimes anger. Have you ever met somebody that when they get scared, they get angry? Or how about this? When you get stressed, do you start to get nasty to people around you? 
You're not very kind. You, you, you kind of have a short fuse. What's happening in that moment? You're expressing, you're expressing fear in, in your life. That's what's happening is there's an expression of that fear. Worry, stress, anxiety, sometimes fear. And not only that, skip down to verse 16 and listen to this. So here's, here's the response to the giant. They get shattered and overwhelmed on the inside. They're falling apart. They get scared, stressed, anxious, worried, uh, and angry, most likely. And then here's verse 16. This is the third thing. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Do you know what that means? 40 days, Goliath keeps coming out and taunting them and telling them that they're going to lose. Pick a, pick a champion. And for 40 days, they don't pick a champion. What are they doing? They're avoiding. We're not going to deal with this. And see, if you want to know what your giants are in your life, here's the questions you can answer. Number one, what makes you feel shattered? What is it that makes you feel like your life is falling apart? It feels like you're just completely overwhelmed. What makes you feel afraid? Where, what, what causes you stress, worry, and anxiety? What do you start to get nasty? When do you, what is it that causes you to kind of start having a short fuse for the people, with the people around you? What about that avoidance in your life, that thing that you don't like, that thing that you hate, that thing that you know you don't want in your life, it shouldn't be in your life, and yet you're not dealing with it, you're not facing it, because maybe you feel like it's just too big, it's just too hard, you can never beat it, you can never actually overcome it. However you answer all of those questions, whatever your answer is, there's your giants. There's your giants. And it might just look, it might be fear. It might be fear of failure. It might be fear of rejection. It might be fear of being alone. It, it might be uh, fear of sickness. It might be fear of death. It might be fear of the future and the uncertainty and the unknown. Maybe it's depression. Maybe you're in a place where you are battling with these emotions that you can't seem to have any control over. One day you're fine, and the next day you're back in that deep darkness, and you don't know why, and you can't change it, and you're overwhelmed by it because... It just feels like you're trapped. Maybe it's just circumstances in your life. Maybe, maybe there's a health situation that's going on. Maybe, maybe cancer. And all of the uncertainties that come with that, that feeling of being out of control, that you can't fix it, you can't change it, you don't know what to do about it. Maybe it's uh, something to do with your kids and something that's out of your control. You can't control their world and, and it's got you overwhelmed or it's got you worried and it's got you at this place where you know you need to have conversations, but you're not having them. Maybe it's something in your marriage. Maybe it's something in your workplace. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your bills are piling up. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe somewhere along the way you got hooked on a drug. Maybe you got hooked on alcohol. Maybe you got hooked on pornography and you hate it. You don't want it there, but it seems like even as hard as you try, you can't change it. You can't beat it. You can't get away from it. You're just trapped in this cycle of going back to it and going back to it and going back to it and you feel like you're stuck and maybe it's a thought pattern that you want to change and it's just overwhelming you. Maybe it's self-hatred and self-loathing that you look in the mirror and you hate what you see. Look, I could keep going. I could list all the giants, but the point is this. Everybody in the room has a giant. Everyone does. What's your answer to those questions? Let me tell you what one of my giants is. And again, I could give you a list. I've got a whole group of them. But one of my giants has been depression. And it's something that I battled with from the time that I was a, a young boy. I don't remember when it started, but I had depression before anybody was willing to talk about it. Back when, you know, nobody really labeled it. And I, and I went through it in silence without ever really being able to talk to anybody about it through my junior high and high school years, thinking often about the idea of taking my own life, of just escaping it, because I looked in the mirror and I hated what I saw. I looked in the mirror and I saw failure and stupid and ugly and all of the other things that you could think of. And I lived in this place of depression, which by the way, carried into my 20s. It carried into my marriage. It carried into my ministry when I became a pastor. It's not like, hey, I became a pastor. I don't wrestle with depression anymore. In fact, it got worse as a pastor. I got into the deepest darkness that I had ever experienced in my life in ministry as a pastor to that place where I thought I will never, ever be free and I will never be better. Everybody in this room has a giant. I don't care how strong you think you are. 
If you're going to see your giant fall, you have to be able to name it. You have to be able to face it. You've got to stop avoiding it and pretending like it's not there. That's number one. Number two, if you're going to see your giant fall, here's what you've got to do. You've got to know the trap. I had a Walter growing up. You had a Walter probably in your life as well growing up. His name probably wasn't Walter, or her name probably wasn't Walter, but, but he was my Walter in, in, in elementary school, and Walter was the school bully. Everybody was afraid of Walter. Everybody looked at Walter and thought, he's going to beat us up. And, 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 and it wasn't because Walter had ever actually, as far as I can remember, Walter had never actually been in a fight. Walter had never beat anybody up, anybody up but everybody was afraid of him anyway. And one day, Walter chose me. I was his, his target. And the day started, I don't know what I did to cross Walter. Nobody really wanted to cross Walter, but something I did bothered him. And at the beginning of the day, he came to me and he said, when the day is over, I'm going to come and I'm going to beat you up. And throughout that entire day, Walter would stare at me across the classroom. And if he ever walked past me, he'd whisper things like, you're dead meat. Or I'm coming for you. All day long, this was going on. And, and I was scared. I mean, I was scared. The whole day I'm watching the clock. You remember, uh, at least in my school, we had the big round white faced clocks with the, you know, the black hands and the red second hand going around. And all day long, I'm just watching the second hand. I'm watching and I'm planning and I'm preparing because I walked home from school. So there's a distance between school and home where I knew Walter could get me. And so I came up with my plan all day long, no school, I'm not paying attention, I'm just strategizing, how do I get everything together as fast as I can and run? And the bell rang at the end of the day, I grabbed everything and I sprinted as fast as I could. I can still remember the doors that I ran out of. I don't remember what grade it was, but I remember the fear and I remember the doors and I remember the field that I sprinted across as fast as I can. And I can tell you this, I don't even know if Walter was there. I don't even know if he came after me, but I was scared. Why was I scared? Because Walter had the power that every bully has. Do you know what the power that a bully has? It's intimidation. He had the power of intimidation. Do you know 1 Peter chapter 5? Peter talks about Satan and he says it this way. He says, we're to be on our guard because Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. Have you ever, if you know that verse, have you ever thought about how bad of a strategy that is for a predator? Because if you've ever watched a real predator hunting its prey in the wild, it's not making a lot of noise, right? It goes into silent stealth mode. It gets low and because it doesn't want to scare away its prey. And yet, Satan, and yet Peter says Satan is like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. Why is he roaring? Here's why. Because Satan has been robbed of his power. He was robbed of his power by God at the cross and through the empty tomb. He has no power but the power that you give to him. And do you know how he gets power from you? He gets power from you through intimidation. That's why he's roaring. That's why he gets loud. Because if he can get you focused on him and the perceived power that he has, then what you end up doing is you are comparing yourself to him going, can I win? And listen, they're called giants for a reason. They're bigger than you. They're stronger than you. And when you focus on the perceived power of the bully, if you focus on the perceived power of the enemy and you hold yourself up, the conclusion that you come to is what? I can't win. I mean, this is, this is in essence, this is Goliath's strategy. It's intimidation. He walks onto the battlefield. Look at verse 4. I didn't read these verses, but look at verse 4. He says, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, who had, whose height was six cubits and a span. Do you know that's nine feet, nine inches? Whenever I picture Goliath, I picture Arnold Schwarzenegger, only taller, right? He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and a weight, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 126 pounds. Now, some of us in the room aren't even 126 pounds, and lots of us in the room can't even lift that amount of weight, and that's just on his upper body. 126 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. It's like 15, 16 pounds. And his shield bearer went before him, and he stood, and he shouted. 
So here this guy comes out. Now he's already massive. He's already bigger than pretty much, he's probably bigger than everybody that's there. And not only is he bigger than everybody, he's a tank, but now he's an armored tank because he's covered himself from head to toe with metal. And he's got extra weapons. He's got tons of weapons. He's got a guy who actually is in front of him with his shields who's working with him. So he's a champion, but now he's not even alone. And then he comes onto the field and he starts shouting. Why? Because the goal of a, of a giant in your life is intimidation. See, the trap that we get pulled into is when we focus on the enemy and the perceived power of the enemy, what we end up doing is we are measuring ourselves against our enemy, against our giant, and the conclusion that we come to is this. He's too big. We can't win. We'll lose if we try. I mean, that's what Saul and the soldiers did in this moment. I mean, for 40 days... Goliath comes out and taunts them, and Saul doesn't sign up. None of the soldiers sign up for, to go out and face him. Why not? Because they've been comparing themselves to Goliath, and they've looked, and they've weighed themselves, and they've been found wanting. They're holding themselves up next to Goliath, and the conclusion is, if we go out and we fight him, we'll lose. It's what Saul does for, Goli for David. When David comes and says, Saul, don't worry about it, I'll go fight him. Saul says, you can't do it, why not? Because Saul does what everybody does. It's the logical thing. Let me hold you up next to Goliath. Let's compare and contrast and go, well, is there any chance of your winning? And Saul, which this would be my conclusion too, Saul comparing David to Goliath, the conclusion is if you go out, you lose. Why? Because you're young and inexperienced. When he was young, he started training. Now he's older and he's a champion, which means he's had success. He knows what he's doing. If, if you go up against him, you're going to obviously lose. If I'm a betting man, I'm betting on Goliath every day. You can't win. Why? Because I'm comparing you to your giant. And when I compare you to your giant, you're going to lose. And listen, when you compare yourself to your giant, that's your conclusion too. In fact, that's some of you. That's right where you are this morning. That you've come in here this morning and maybe you've never labeled it a giant, but you've got that thing in your life that you know about that you aren't facing because you've looked at it and your conclusion that you've come to as you have measured yourself to it is that there is no way that you will ever beat it. There's no way you'll ever win. There's no way you'll ever be free. There's no way you'll ever change. You are who you are. You are where you are, and that's just the way it is. And you've gotten your place, yourself into that place where you say, I can't win. I'm hopeless. I can't do it. I'm hopeless. And that's where David comes to us this morning, and he says, you're half right. You can't do it, but that doesn't mean you're hopeless. So here's point number three. If, if you're going to see your giant fall you've got to know your hope. And see, this is the difference between David and everybody else who's there on that battlefield that day. It's the difference between David and everybody else because everyone's seeing the same giant. It's not like David is completely clueless. He sees the giant. He sees his armor. He sees his weapons. But see, he's doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is comparing themselves to Goliath, but David's comparing Goliath to who? To God. See, the first time that David hears Goliath on the battlefield, the question he asks is, who's going to teach Goliath who God actually is? And everybody else is running and hiding, and it's almost as if David is looking at everybody else and going, wait a minute, have you forgotten who we are? Have you forgotten who God is in this moment? And he shows us four things, actually, four things that David says about who God is that should shape the way that you look at your giants. It should change the whole way that you see your giant. Four things. Number one, he says, God is the living God. See, listen, before I expand on that, let me say this. When you hold your giant up next to God, your giant loses its power. And here's why. Because as big and as impossible as your giant might seem to you, there is nothing that is beyond the power and the strength and the grace of God that it cannot be defeated. Nothing. It loses its power because it gets put in its place. David says, here's number one. Number one, God is the living God. It's actually in verse 26. Look at chapter 17, verse 26. So David hears Goliath, and here's what he says to the soldiers standing around him. He says, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of who? What does it say? The living God. David says it's not just God, he's the living God, which isn't just a throwaway word that he adds to God. It's a very important word because here's what it means. God is this God that we know and we're serving is the one true God. There are no other gods. 
Every other God is a myth. Every other God is make-believe. There is no other God. In fact, as, listen, Paul writes about this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven on earth, Yet there, us, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom we all are all things and through whom we exist. He says there's only one God. It's the God who flung planets into their place, the one who holds everything together, the one who spoke all of this by the power of his word. He's the one who created and shaped you. And by the way, the God who is so vast that when he created the universe, which is beyond your capacity to be able to understand, when he created it, he created it with the tips of his fingers. That's how vast our God is. And it's not just he's the living God. He is our God and we are his people. Because he says he's defined the armies of the living God. He's saying we belong to this living God. We're, we're, we're his. When he calls Goliath this uncircumcised Philistine later on, he's not just name calling. He's not just talking about his anatomy in that moment. See, at that time, circumcision, it was a symbol of being a part of God's covenant community. If you were circumcised, you were one of God's people. If you weren't circumcised, you were somebody, you, were, you worshiped another God. And so when he says this is an uncircumcised Philistine, he's saying, listen, this is a guy who worships a God who isn't real. This is a guy who worships gods who are fake. And we serve the living God and hear this, it's Romans chapter 8, if that God, if our God, if God is for us, then who can be against us? If the living God is for us, then what can men do for me? Which means when I'm living in fear of my giants, I've forgotten that God is the living God. I've forgotten who my God is. Number two, he's the God who delivers us. All right, he says it to, 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 to Saul. Remember Saul says, you can't go, you can't fight him, you can't win. And David says, well, let me tell you why I'm going to win. And I love the balance of what David says to him because he says, listen, I was a shepherd. Up to this point in time, what we know David has done, he's been a shepherd and he's, been, he's played music. And David says, when I was a shepherd, I was prepared. Here's why. Because I was watching over my flock. And when I watched over my flock, there were bears and there were lions that would come and attack and I would kill them to protect my sheep. But then notice what he says, not just that he killed them, but look at verse 7, 17, 37, excuse me. Look at verse 37. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He says, I killed them, but the only reason I was able to kill them is because God was at work in and through me, because God was empowering me to do that. And that's why I'm going to be able to win this battle because God delivers. He delivered me in the past and he's going to deliver me now. He's won the battle before, and he's going to win the battle now, not just as if God is separate from me and he doesn't use me, but God is at work in me. He's at work through me. He's empowering me to fight this battle, and that's what I'm going to win. And by the way, Israel should have known that. They should have remembered that. Why? Because their whole history is because of God's grace and rescue. They've been rescued from Egypt by the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their house. They've been rescued from, the Pharaoh, from Pharaoh's armies by God parting the Red Sea and closing it back behind them. They've been rescued from a wilderness by God's provision for them, miraculous provision of food and water as they walked through that wilderness. He'd rescued them from nations who had armies and fortified cities. He'd rescued them again and again and again. And David says, that's who God is. And he hasn't changed. And not only is that who God is, but here's number three. He's the God who is with us. He's the God who, who is living. He's the God who delivers by his power and grace. And he's the God who's with us. Paul, Saul says it right at the end of this verse, verse 37. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. For me, that's Saul kind of giving a throwaway statement like God be with you. Good luck. But for David, it was a reality. If David could have turned around in that moment, here's what he would have said. He is. The Lord is with me because the Lord has never left me. The Lord doesn't leave. The Lord doesn't forsake. It's the promise that God makes to Joshua on the borders of the promised land. It's a verse that so many people have memorized, but let me read it to you again. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, have I not commanded you? This is God speaking. This is the Lord. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? And listen, see if this, this sounds familiar at all to you in terms of what we're talking about this morning. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Those two words are the same words that are used to describe what the soldiers and Saul experience when they hear Goliath and they see Goliath on the battlefield. And here in this moment, God says, you don't have to be scared and you don't have to be shattered. Same words. Why not? 
because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. If you are living in that place of, your, of fear, of being stuck and paralyzed in the presence of your giant, it's because you've forgotten that he's the living God who delivers by his power and grace, who is with you. And here's the last thing, number four, he's committed to his glory. He is the God who is committed to his glory. In other words, God wants his greatness, the truth and the reality of who he is to go public to the world. David says it in verse uh, 46. Look at right before he charges Goliath on the battlefield. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Listen, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. David says, I'm going to win and here's why. Because when I win, it's going to bear witness to this reality that Yahweh is God. There is one God, and he is in Israel. The God of Israel is the one true and living God, and the world will know it. And number two, so that God's people will know that they will win, not because of their power, not because of what they do, but because God is the God who delivers by his grace. The battle is the Lord's. The battle belongs to him. Listen, God is committed to his glory, and here's why that's good news. Because if you're his then it means he's also committed to your ultimate victory because your victory reveals the greatness of his glory. This is why David can go onto the battlefield in confidence. This is why David can go out and face Goliath, not because of self-esteem, not because of self-confidence, but because of God, God confidence. Because he has put his faith in God who is with him, who is the living God, who is empowering him, who will deliver him. And he goes onto the battlefield, and on that day, Goliath is defeated. On that day, the giant falls. On that day, the giant is defeated. Listen, if you want to be free, if you want to be free of your giant, Number one, you've got to know your giant. You've got to be able to name it. You've got to identify it. You've got to stop ignoring it. You've got to stop avoiding it. And you've got to actually be able to point it out and say, that's what my giant is. And maybe, again, maybe it's a group of giants, but you've got to be able to identify it. You've got to get clear on what it is. You can't fight what you're unwilling to actually see. That's number one. Number two, if you're going to see your giant fall, then you've got to stop falling into the trap of comparing yourself to your giant. And you've got to start comparing your giant to God. When your giant starts to speak, and it does, it says things just like Walter walking through the classroom and saying, I'm coming for you. Your giant says things in your mind. It communicates with you, and it tells you you can't win. You're a loser. You're too weak. You're stuck. You'll never change. When your giant starts to speak, here's what you have to do. You've got to tell the giant the truth, and you've got to tell yourself the truth. You've got to start speaking yourself. And here's the truth. The truth is this, is that the one true living God, the God who delivers by his grace and power, is also the God who is with you, committed to his glory, committed to your victory, so that if, here's the the reality, if God is for you, here's the truth, who can be against you? If God is for you, then what can men do to you? If God is for you, then what is impossible to change? What giant cannot be destroyed? What giant cannot be defeated? But listen, it's not just enough to speak the truth. You've got to believe the truth. And see, for some of us in the room, all that sounds nice. But you go, yeah, like, how do we even know that any of this is true? How do we know that, that God is the living God? He's the one true God. How, how do we know that he's the God who delivers by his grace and that he's actually with us and that he's committed to his glory and then wants us to experience victory? How do we know any of that? And here's the answer I'll give you this morning is because there's a greater giant than Goliath. It's the giant of your sin. It's the giant of your rebellion against God, of your rejection of God. It's your disobedience against God. It's the giant that has ruled your life and your existence. It has damaged you and this world. It is a giant that controls you, manipulates you, pushes you down, 
It disintegrates you. It's the giant that has put you in a place where you are powerless. You cannot defeat it. You cannot break free from it. It doesn't matter how hard you try. You stand under the giant of sin condemned to death, to an eternity separated from God. But hear this. God did not leave you under the rule of that giant. But God loved you so much that he sent a champion to fight on your behalf. The champion. There's not just a greater giant, there's a greater David. And that greater David is Jesus Christ who came into this world to do for you what you could not do for yourself. That he came into the valley of this world to go and face that giant on your behalf. Not just at the risk of his life, but at the cost of his life. At the cost of his life, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for you in your place on the cross. And that on the cross, he paid the penalty for your sins. All of it. He said it, the last thing, it is finished. It is paid in full. It's already done. He died, was buried. He rose again, conquered sin and death, and cut off the head of your enemy, the greatest enemy, the enemy of your soul, so that you might be set free, not by your might, not by sword and spear, not by good works and efforts, for the battle is the Lord's. That he fought on just, see, listen, not one person in the army of Israel raised a finger that day. David fought on their behalf, and because of his victory, it was all of theirs. Because of Jesus' victory, it's yours. But here's the challenge. You've got to believe it. You've got to accept it. You've got to receive it. It's not something that you earn and pay for. It's not something that you deserve because of how many Sundays you come to church, or how many good works that you check off your list, or how much money you put in an offering plate. It's been paid for already, and the only thing that you can do is accept it and receive it. And that's the invitation. It, the, the message of David is not first and foremost, go fight your giants. The message of David, first and foremost, is, is God's already defeated the giant. And he's done it for you. Now celebrate and live in the freedom of that. Believe it. That's number one. But listen, number two, here's what it means. God has set you free from the roaring lion, from Satan himself. And that means that every giant in your life will fall. It's just a question of time. It may not be immediate. It's not always like David. You go on the battlefield and boom, your giant's done. I would love to say that the depression in my life is gone. I would love to tell you that I never experienced darkness in my life. But that would be a lie. It's not true. But every time I face it, I can fight it with confidence and hope. And here's why. Because I know it's just a matter of time. It may not be immediate, but it's inevitable. Looking to eternity, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The former things are your giants. There is a day coming where there will be no more addiction. There will be no more depression. There will be no more fear. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more loss. Every giant that you have experienced in your life will be dead, it will be gone, and you will be free, and that means it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time, which means you can stand, fight, and live in this one truth, and here it is. God has won. God will win, and because of him, if you're his, so will you.